Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in Freshman English. We now turn in your hymnals to pages 718, 719 and following. Now this is really important stuff, so I want you to be paying attention with your hymnal open. We will be working now in Poetry Collection 7 and Poetry Collection 8, focusing specifically at level 2B on the literary analysis topic of rhyme and meter. And while we'll come back to all of this again later in your high school career, it is hypercritical that you at least be introduced to some of this information regarding rhyme and meter. Uh, read with me on page 719. Rhyme and meter are two literary devices often used in poetry. Rhyme, let's get the definition, repetition of sounds at the end of words. And there are several types of rhyme. You'll want all of these in your notes. Exact rhyme, which is exactly the repetition, love, dove. Slant rhyme, the repetition of words that end with similar sounds, but do not rhyme perfectly as in prove, glove. I hope you're working with me on page 719. End rhyme, the rhyming of words at the end of lines. Internal rhyme, the rhyming of words within a line. For example, we just saw that in our study, for example, of uh, Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven, internal rhyme. Rhyme scheme, this is an important word for us, is a regular pattern of end rhymes in a poem or stanza in which a letter is assigned to each set of rhyming sounds. For example, in Ring Out Wild Bells, Alfred Lord Tennyson uses the rhyme scheme A, B, A, B. So notice, for example, Ring Out Wild Bells to the Wild Sky, The Flying Cloud, The Frosty Light. Notice sky and light don't rhyme, which is why they get an A and a B. The year is dying in the night. Night rhymes with, uh, night rhymes with light, and so you get another B. Ring out wild bells and let him die. Back, die, and sky rhyme together, and so on. And you can kind of see this. They give you an example from Jabberwocky as well. Now, meter is something different. Rhythmical pattern in a line of poetry that results from the arrangement of stress. Do you see that little sign in parentheses? And unstressed, it looks kind of like a little U uh, syllables. The stress goes on the syllable that's accented in natural speech. Reading the line aloud reveals the steady rhythmic pulse of the stress lines. Notice the flying cloud, the frosty light, half a league, half a league, half a league onward. You can kind of see where the unstressed stressed is going to be placed. Each meter is named based on its length and rhythmical pattern. A common pattern uses IMs, I-A-M-B-S, you want that in your notes, beats in which the stress is on the second syllable, ba-bum, ba-bum, right, such as hello or allow. In iambic pentameter, each line contains five of these iambic feet. Do you notice how it's, how it's um, uh, measured? Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Look at the bottom of 719. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. That's five iambic feet. Pent simply meaning five, okay? Now, over on to page 720. This is huge. I want this uh, chart in your notes. An iambic dimeter would consist of two iams. A trimeter consists of three iams. A tetrameter consists of four iams, and so on. Do you got me? So you'll want to see that, and I'm not going to spend too much time with this because we'll be paying attention as we study, right? Now, there is, of course another kind of poetry. It's a poem that doesn't include all of this rhyme, rhyme, scheme, regular meter stuff. We call that free verse. And then we've got blank verse when we study our Romeo and Juliet, for example. And that one for us will be, we don't have rhyme, but we have the consistent iambic pentameter of ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks. We should point out already what we will say later, that Shakespeare writes all of Romeo and Juliet using that blank verse pattern, okay? Now, we're going to look for different types of rhyme, different types of rhyme scheme, and, of course, uh, understandings of meter as well. Hey, uh, by the way, on 721, our reading skill will be to paraphrase. This is what we do at level one, summarizing, briefly summarizing. And they'll give you some hints on how to do that, and they even give you a paraphrase chart to kind of help you, okay? On the page 722, we've got, of course, the same guiding question, how does communication change us, evolve us, grow us, challenge us, and then we've got some vocabulary as well. Now we're going to be working with Robert Frost's The Road Not Taken in our study here to begin with, okay? Notice your dates on 723, 1874 to 1963. In January 1961, when John F. Kennedy became President of the United States, he called on fellow New Englander Robert Frost to recite two poems at the inauguration. At the time, Frost was America's most famous living poet. 
He became famous when a boy's will in 1913 and, a nor and north of Boston in 1914 won wide praise in both the United Kingdom and the United States. Now, let's say three things here before we get started on this poem. One, Robert Frost, without question, one of America's greatest poets. Two, we will meet Robert Frost again in your junior year. I know I've said this about several of the uh, writers that we've been working with, and I've already given a lot of information in the junior folder of LearnStrong.net. If you're interested, as freshmen, you can always go and find more information on Robert Frost there, biographic and the like. We're going to spend nine now with the road not taken. I want you to write this down as the third thing. I said we'd say three things. Uh, there's a couple of things we're going to pay attention to here. Obviously, we're going to pay attention to this as a poem in terms of level 2B, that kind of notion of um, sound and rhythm and all those kinds of things. But we're also going to ask you about the message at level 2A. This is, without question, one of Frost's most famous poems because it speaks to a powerful message. And we're going to see if we can figure out that message. Okay? Let's go ahead and read the poem. The road, not taken. I'm with you now on 725. Just follow along. The road, not taken. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both, and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the others just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Now, let's begin by, first of all, just pointing out that this is a poem, notice it, of how many stanzas, do you see it? Notice we've got rhyme scheme of a kind, right? Wood, stood, both, could, right? Growth, playing, playing games with the end rhyme. Notice we've got rhythm internally. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. So we've got games going on here of that kind. But I want to pay more closer attention to the metaphor. Right? Because we're going back to the very beginning of our time together in freshman English, I answered the question, the imaginary question, why do we ever have to read at multiple levels? Here is a classic example of why. Question, is this a poem about walking in the woods and coming up on two different optional paths? No, it isn't, is it? This is really a poem that is about something far more profound and how do we know that? The final line of the poem. That's made all the difference. Meaning what? This is a poem about choices. Of course, in this poem, we have two choices. Quite literally, we have two choices. He comes up to a Y in the road, and as the great Yogi Berra says, when you come to a Y in the road, take it, right? Or a fork in the road, take it. So he comes up to a fork in the road, and we got two paths going in two separate directions, right? He has a decision that he has to make. What is that decision? Which road will I take? One road is beaten down. Lots and lots of people have clearly taken that road. The other road is overgrown. People have not taken that road. And he has to make a choice. Which choice road do I take? And he looks and he thinks for a little bit and then he decides, you know what? I'm going to save the one that everybody goes down. I'm going to go down the road less traveled by. That's his decision. That's his choice. But then we will hear this final line. I took the road less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Okay, so what's going on here about choices? Well, of course, let's jump to 2A to already. We are in this poem hearing, there are two ways to decide. There is, of course, the way, the road, the path, that everybody is traveling down, right? And then there's the other one. It's the road that not too many people go down. This is, of course, to jump to 3A already very quickly, this is the choice that is being articulated in Longfellow's Psalm of Life. 
in this world's broad field of battle in the bivouac of life. Be not like dumb, driven cattle. Be a hero in the strife. Don't go down the road everyone else goes down. Message number two, you are defined by your choices. They make you who you are. And in the process of choosing, message number three, you are the only one responsible for those choices. How you make those choices have everything to do with how you relate to yourself and to others. Just because other people make a choice doesn't mean that you have to also make that choice. Sometimes the difference is in choosing to go your own way. At level 2B, well, we've already talked about all kinds of poetic devices that are at play there. For example, notice the symbol of the road not taken. The road not taken is a symbol. It's a metaphor, isn't it? It's a choice that you make that's rooted in what? Your belief that it's better sometimes to go your own way, to make your own choice, right? I once had a, a student, father, very, very gifted wrestler, spent all of his time teaching his son how to become a very, very gifted wrestler. When the young man entered high school, he decided he wasn't going to wrestle. He was going to give all of his energies to music and to acting. This did not go well for him with his father. His father had all kinds of challenges for him. And then the young man read this poem. And that was enough. And he said, you know what? This poem is telling me that I made the right choice. Why? Because I made a choice that was right for me. Even though I had tremendous athletic talents and abilities, also was gifted with the ability to play music and to act. Who says necessarily that one is better than the other? It's not a matter of whether one is better than the other. It's a matter of what it is I want to do. He says, I took the road that was not expected, less traveled. And it has made the difference, he said. It's a fascinating way to read this poem, no question. Level 3A, okay, what is for you the text of all texts that tells you? You got to take your own road. You got to go your own way. You got to be proud of who you are, and you've got to be pleased if your road takes you in a different direction from all of the other roads that other people like to travel down. You'll uh, maybe um, uh, study in your junior year the great Ralph Waldo Emerson, and we will meet that classic essay, Self Reliance. He who would be a man, here we mean a true human, a free human, must be a nonconformist. To be great is to be misunderstood. Finally, at 3B, what is the moment in your life you can remember? Two questions. One, when you didn't take the road less traveled, you took the road that everybody else took, and you look back now and you say, man, I kind of wish I hadn't done it that way. Let's ask it up, a, a more positive question to finish, though. Can you jot down in your life one moment in your life when you took the road less traveled, and it did make all the difference for you? It somehow has defined fundamentally who you are. Well, the great Robert Frost, the road not taken, we will come back again to this poem again later in our junior year, by the way. Thank you.